All right, on this lecture, we're going to talk about some really important concepts for you to fully understand to be successful as wildlife habitat managers. So when you look at this picture right here, even if you don't know what to call this plant community, you probably instinctively know a few things about it. So for example, think about what wildlife species you might see associated with this. Would any wildlife species that you can think of use it? Absolutely not, right? We know that there are probably a suite of species that will use this type of community structure for a variety of things. And there are many wildlife species that would be completely associated with different structural and compositional assemblages of plants and would not use this at all for any habitat component. So that's a really important concept that we're gonna talk about in this class. And even if you don't know that this is called an old field community, because the plants associated with the community and the stage of succession that we're in are what we would define as old field community, you still, as a, a wildlife practicing wildlife biologist or studying wildlife biologist, you already uh, know some of the basic concept that not all wildlife are created equal and not all of them will use the same types of vegetation. So that's a really important thing. If you've noticed right here, there are a couple of prominent plants that are really conspicuous, like this orange flowered one. I wonder how many of you actually know what plant this is. I know I'm always surprised with the level of skills that students start with in the course. There's always a few naturalists that are really into plants. And then there are a lot of people who have never really thought about identifying plants. So it'll be a lot of fun in this course because we're going to spend a lot of time making sure that everyone has developed some basic plant identification skills. So this orange flowered plant here is called orange milkweed. And that is a herbaceous forb. We're going to talk about what those terms mean in a few minutes, but it's a really important flower for pollinators, but also the, the four uh, seed production and structure is really important for a suite of wildlife, which we'll talk about. Uh, here's a native bunch grass, a native warm season grass. It's called yellow Indian grass. Here's another separate species of native warm season grass that is a, a little blue stem, I believe. Uh, but these primarily, all of these plants in here are herbaceous uh, forb and grass species. Notice we do have some woody species. Again, we're going to talk about these terms, uh, these eastern red cedars right here, but most of the plant biomass is herbaceous. That's a pretty important thing. Uh, the grasses are actually perennial. A lot of these forbs are annual. These are all going to be really important things when we go through this lecture. So I mentioned several species could be closely associated with it. And here are two that are very closely associated with this kind of plant community structure. So you probably have seen this butterfly. I'm sure many of you already know what it is, but that is a monarch. I'm curious to know whether or not you know this bird species. I'll give you a hint, or actually the picture gives you a hint other than the, the bird is in it the thing that is being held in its mouth is actually part of the name of the bird. So if you said grasshopper sparrow, you'd be correct. So uh, many of our wildlife species in the eastern United States are actually uh, use old field communities for part of their habitat requirements, and some of them are obligates, like this grasshopper sparrow right here they're obligated to this community type. And one of the reasons that I started with this community type is because it's largely missing from the landscape. Usually uh, when we measure the percentage of early succession, you know, at a county level or at a state level in most of the southeastern states, we're talking about single digit percentage is of this uh, is available as part of that early succession. So a large portion of the landscape is not early succession anyway. We're gonna talk about what that means in a few minutes. And it, most of it has been converted to agriculture or 
uh, to pasture grasses, so non-native pasture grasses. That's probably what you're accustomed to driving by when you look out, uh, like if you drive down I-75 uh, from Gainesville, you would be looking at a lot of, of this, uh, these grasslands that are being grazed and they've been converted to what we would call an improved pasture grass that is non-native to our systems. The structure and composition of this plant community provides very, uh, it, it very well provides the habitat components necessary for a lot of our early succession obligates, but a lot of the the uh, other land use practices that we've implemented, such as converting them to that pasture grass or uh, converting them to other types of agriculture, or of course, uh, growing trees in there instead, are not conducive to that. And that's why uh, many of the species of conservation concern in the Eastern United States are actually associated very closely with this early succession in these old field plant communities like this. Okay, this one probably looks a little more familiar to you and uh, several of you that, that have taken wildlife techniques or, or uh, wildlife of Florida have probably explored areas that look like this. If you've been out to Ordway, you've been in this type of system. So think about what wildlife species would be associated with this and are they the same ones that would be associated with the old field communities? So we would call that a longleaf plant community. And there are quite a few species that are endemic or closely associated with this type of plant community. Some things that are pretty typical of the longleaf plant community are exactly what you're seeing here. You'll have adult trees, very high sunlight penetration. Uh, we'll talk about what kind of forest structure that is. That'd actually be closer to a savanna structure or woodland structure, which we'll talk about in more detail. But this system, just like the old field community, is maintained by frequent disturbances, namely fire in this particular one. Notice we have a few species that are obligated to this system that are kind of iconic in Florida. Uh, so we have the red cockaded woodpecker and the gopher tortoise. Those are two species that, that are uh, thought of usually when people were thinking about wildlife associated with this community, but there are literally hundreds of species associated with, with uh, longleaf forests of, of wildlife that is. And uh, I mean, even the gopher tortoises burrows themselves have hundreds of species that have been documented using that, many of them that are obligated to the burrow itself, to that unique habitat feature that's provided, which is why we would call that an ecosystem engineer. So this one you may not be uh, quite as familiar with, but one thing that is very important about this is actually all this bare sand. A lot of the species of wildlife associated with, with this system need this bare ground interspersed with a, a bunch of the native plants. So this is Florida shrub scrub, and this is a really cool plant community in Florida that has a bunch of unique species like the scrub lizard. The scrub dray is a really cool bird uh, that's associated with this. You can see over in the bottom right corner with this Florida map, uh, there's not that much of it across the state, but it is a really cool plant community. This one again is really closely associated with disturbances, namely prescribed fire. Okay, so historically, many of the plant communities in Florida were influenced strongly by frequent fire. And most of the plant communities in the state, outside of uh, some of the, the mesic uh, areas, uh, which we'll talk about, or hydric areas in particular, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit here in a few minutes, what that means. Uh, Many of our plant communities, especially in the uplands, were strongly influenced by fire, and that often would even creep down into the wetlands and affect the species assemblages there. But fire is doing a really important thing because it's manipulating 
what stage of succession we're in in many cases and it in uh, most cases is very uh, important to manage the structure and composition of the vegetation that we're looking at. So in this class, you're probably going to get tired of fire, but we focus on fire a lot because it has been such a critical process to shaping the community assemblages in Florida in many different kinds of systems with many wildlife species, but also it's one of the tools that we can most effectively implement to manage wildlife habitat, especially in Florida. So uh, that's why we focus on it so much. All right, so I've thrown a bunch of terms at you already, so I wanted to, to take a minute to make sure that you really understand what these different terms mean. And by the way, these probably will show up on tests and quizzes throughout the, the uh, rest of the course. So make sure that you understand what these different terms mean. So you've already heard me say herbaceous and woody. Think about what that means to you. I hear people use those terms all the time and what I realize is the way that we commonly use it colloquially is not actually accurate for what the term means itself. So for a herbaceous plant, uh, what that actually means is that the plant itself dies down. So we have a stem that's grown, it uh, produced leaves, flowers, produces fruit or seed, and then that stem uh, if it's a warm season plant, would die down at the, you know, during the fall. And it, if it's a perennial plant, it would overwinter as just a rootstock, and then it would spring new growth from the root system above ground. So the, the tissue above ground that supports the buds dies back each year. So if we had an annual herbaceous plant, that would just mean that the plant completes its entire life cycle in one growing season. Okay, so it goes, a seed germinates and that grows into a plant, it produces a flower and produces seed and then dies completely. A perennial herbaceous plant would be one that the rootstock could live for years and years and years and these, the stem that's above ground that supports buds each year dies back every year, okay? Many of them will overwinter in different forms like bulbs and rhizomes, tubers, stolons. We're going to talk a little bit about what those are in a minute. A woody plant is, I mean, you're, you know, most people think of trees and that'd be a great example of a woody plant. But what that term actually means is that the structural tissue that, that uh, supports a bud remains alive throughout multiple years. So these are perennial plants and the buds grow from the same above ground tissue year after year, all right? Most people, what I find, think of a woody plant as something that has a really high, particularly lignin content, and that is not necessarily true. There are many herbaceous plants that have very high lignin content, and there are some woody plants that are the opposite. So that is, that is a tendency of these two groups, Herbaceous tend to have lower lignin than woody plants, but that is not what separates them. It is based on whether or not the, the stem that supports buds dies back each year or not. Okay, so you're going to hear the term plant growth form in the class. And I'm going to ask you on quizzes, by the way, there will be plant identification quizzes commonly in the course. And I might ask you a question like what plant growth form is the plant that you're having to identify? All right. So notice we have them broken into herbaceous and woody plants. And the growth forms would be things like forbs, legumes, grasses, and grass-like. That would be like sedges and, and uh, graminoids. So that would be the growth form of the plant, all right? So we could have a herbaceous plant, like this top left picture is Desmodium. By the way, that's my favorite genus. That'll probably be asked to you at some time, Desmodium. So that 
that is a perennial herbaceous forb, all right? It also happens to be a legume in that case. So that would be the answer if I asked you what is the growth form. You could either write forb or legume on that answer. So the forbs, legumes, and grasses and grass lakes all are herbaceous plants and woody plants would include most vines, although there are some herbaceous vines, but typically vines are woody. We'll, t we'll learn uh, some of both throughout the course. Uh, shrubs and trees are all woody plants. All right, so I've already talked about a couple of terms about root systems that are pretty important for you to understand, particularly the ones that I want you to focus on are rhizome and stolon. And the reason is uh, many of our plants in our ecosystems here have a rhizome or stolon, in some cases both. All right, and those structures, essentially a rhizome is underground and a stolon is above ground, but those root system both have buds along the root system. So if the plant gets top killed, the, it can then re-sprout from another bud from that root system with the rhizome that's underground, the stolon, it's above ground. All right, so make sure that you know those two things because you will get asked about it. These are particularly important because they store a lot of resources in those root systems, and that allows these plants to withstand things like intensive herbivory or fire or disease that top kills that stem. The plant can then re-sprout from buds. Another thing that's really important about that is if you look at this plant over on the right side, this is actually one of our uh, this is Bermuda, which is extremely invasive, all right? So we brought it here for an improved pasture grass. You see it all the time if you've looked out in pastures. It's very common, but if you're going to try to restore early successional communities in the south, it's almost always going to require trying to get rid of this plant, all right? So that's Bermuda. The reason I'm showing you this plant specifically is because you can see it has a rhizome. So that's this, this uh, gray or, or tan colored root at the very bottom of the picture. So that is the rhizome. And then you can see a running green stem that's kind of going laterally across. And you can see those roots actually coming out at each of the, the uh, the uh, collars around where the, the stem is branching. So that would be a stolen on this particular plant. It actually has both. That's one of the reasons it's so invasive and so difficult to get rid of is because it's so well uh, uh, equipped with these adaptations, with uh, those two in particular, to withstand intensive herbivory, intensive disturbance. Uh, so they're, you know, really, uh, we're relegated or forced, in other words, into using herbicide to try to get rid of it. And unfortunately, uh, the structure that it, pro that it uh, promotes is not conducive to many of our wildlife species that we would be trying to promote with early successional communities. So this is always going to be in there and it disrupts the structure that we need for a lot of our wildlife species. So we have no choice but to try to uh, get rid of it with herbicides if we're trying, you know, if our objective is to restore those plant communities. So very important plant species. And, you know, that's one of the reasons that it has been such a good improved pasture grass for agriculture is because it can withstand really high herbivory. We can stock really high densities of cattle on it and graze them. And it withstands that fine. It doesn't have to be replanted all the time. Once you plant it, you have a, a nice uh, pasture of it and you can really abuse it and it still just keeps on going. So that makes it really hard to control, unfortunately, for our purposes as wildlife biologists. Okay, throughout the course, you'll also hear us talk about the different kinds of seeds and fruits on uh, various species that you'll be learning. Here I'm showing you an assortment of different kinds.
We'll learn a lot about hard mast and soft mast in particular, but uh, you may hear us say any of these terms that you're seeing. So make sure that you understand the different kinds of structures. They're often associated with adaptations for how they disperse themselves. So here are a couple of examples of hard mast that you're probably familiar with. So the bottom right, those are acorns on an oak and the top left are from a hickory. You can see the uh, nuts with the husk on it. Here are a couple of examples of soft mass from species that you will definitely see uh, during this course. The top right, those are elderberry and uh, many different bird species you will see consuming those small fruits like that. They also are quite tart and uh, it may be used in, in uh, I believe there's elderberry pie or something along those lines. You can look that up, but uh, they tend to have a real tart flavor. And then these are common persimmon on the bottom left. Those are a much larger fruit and they actually are are very sweet. In fact, uh, this is one of the highest sugar content fruits and it is also my favorite fruit, my favorite wild fruit to eat. And uh, I think that's a, this is some a place that we can talk about some of these adaptations so that you can intuitively understand the strategy of the plants. That's pretty important because even if you don't know what the plant is, if you understand what some of these adaptations of the plant are, you can infer what the wildlife value might be. So in this case, which one of these do you think would be more likely to get dispersed by birds? I'll give you a second to think about that. So if you're thinking the elderberry, you'd be correct. It has, first of all, a smaller fruit, right? They're very easy to digest or to ingest uh, for a variety of birds that might be quite small relative to mammals, at least to many of the mammals. And also, uh, you remember I said it had a tart flavor. Well, birds uh, don't key, they're, they're, the uh, sweetness is not nearly as important of a cue to encourage consumption as it would be for a mammal, which is much more likely to disperse the persimmon here. So uh, those persimmons are too large for, for a variety of bird species, although the small ones may, be get, eat, may get eaten by a wild turkey. So uh, you can see, you know, the really big bird it may eat the small fruits from this species, but by and large, most of the seed dispersal is probably by mammals. This is pretty consistent when you start looking at traits across plant species. We start to see them grouping into these diffuse mutualisms, which you'll hear David Mason talk about a lot in his lecture. Uh, they group these characteristics based on how they are trying to interact with plants. Remember these or, or uh, with animals, excuse me. Remember these plants are not mobile and they're relying on animals which are mobile to disperse their seeds to somewhere else. And you'll see a suite of adaptations that are related to that effort. Okay, here's a, a few other terms you've heard me say. You may already know what uh, these mean, but I just wanted to put a slide in here to make it very clear to you. So a perennial plant, it lives for at least three years. So uh, there are some other uh, plant adaptations and for growth cycles, but these are the really common ones, particularly the annual and perennial are the most common. So trees are perennial, but there are also uh, a variety of forbs and grasses that are perennial as well. And uh, typically, uh, the annual plants, you will see those primarily associated with early succession, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, uh, what, what the definition of early succession is. But uh, annual plants only live in, during one growing season, so they complete their entire life cycle. Uh, we do have some vernal and autumnal uh, plants as well, but these will be much less common and the biennials uh, are pretty uncommon as well.
Okay, so we also describe many of our vegetation associations based on the amount of water that exists. So a xeric site just means that uh, the plant community in that site requires or gets a very small amount of moisture. So it's really dry. An extreme xeric site might be a desert, for instance, but uh, the the shrub scrub that we talked about, that would be a pretty extreme xeric site. The uh, sand dunes at the edge of the ocean might be xeric as well. Mesic just means that there's a well-balanced supply of moisture. This is your typical upland mixed hardwood forest, or uh, you may see it on some slopes and uh, down in, in uh, protected valleys in the mountains. So uh, hydric sites, those are the ones that are associated with wetlands and the, the conditions are saturated and you'll see the indicators in soil and everything of wetlands. Okay, so I keep saying the word succession when I'm describing these plant communities. So now let's just go ahead and, and uh, really talk in depth about what I mean when I say succession. So there are two types. What you're looking at is a graph or a depiction here of secondary succession, and we'd also uh, could have primary succession. So what is the difference in the two? Well, primary succession means that all of the biological material, all the animals and plants and everything are colonizing an area from outside of that area. So if you think about uh, a volcano creating a new island, for instance, everything that colonizes that new island had to come from somewhere else. That would be an example of primary succession. More commonly across the landscape is secondary succession, and that would be akin to what you would see if you had a stand replacing wildfire, for instance, or a hurricane, or you know those kinds of disturbances that are more typical across our landscape. A lot of the things that are recolonizing that area, for instance, plants, may have already been in the seed bank and survived that disturbance that was stand replacing, you know, that killed all of the existing plants uh, that were above ground, but the plants were able to colonize from the seed bank. That would be an example of second, secondary succession. So notice when you look at the different levels here, you see that there are plant species within different growth forms and with different adaptations associated with different seral stages. So that would be each individual slot here that you're looking at. These, these terms, by the way, are very important. So uh, each individual slot we would call a seral stage. Notice annual plants are the first things to colonize. So that would be early succession. As long as the plant community is dominated by herbaceous plant biomass, even the three and four years in this depiction after that, that's primarily grasses that are perennial so and uh, grasses and forbs that are perennial. The first stage would be primarily annual, but in both of the first two stages, they're primarily dominated by herbaceous annuals and perennials, depending on where you're at. That, by definition, is early succession. It's those first two stages. Notice here in this one uh, where I have seral stage marked, that is a really long time frame. That's when you have all these intermediate species. Uh, you may have some grasses and forbs mixed into that, but the primary biomass in that, the plant biomass in that system is uh, woody plants. So it'll be young trees and shrubs dominating those areas. All right. Once, if we go longer without a disturbance, a lot of those trees that colonize now reach full canopy closure. And the important thing is we'd call that a climax community because it doesn't continue to transition after that, right? 
So if we just had an area that did not have any disturbances, it would continue in a very similar climax commu community in perpetuity. So essentially, so your succession is sort of stopping at that point, right? Whereas if you use disturbance to, re to uh, restart succession or move to an earlier place in succession, that predictable uh, plant community transition would occur back to that climax community. And we have some interesting cases like longleaf ecosystem would be one of those. Uh, where the climax community is actually being maintained by a recurring disturbance, right? So the reason longleaf pine ecosystem can remain in perpetuity in the in dominance by longleaf pine is because of recurring frequent fire. If you take fire out of the system, it will actually continue to transition into a hardwood dominated system. So the climax community would be very different depending on whether or not that fundamental process is present. Okay, so it's kind of confusing uh, to really think through that, but uh, it is pretty unique to our systems here. All, you know, like I said earlier, most of them are really strongly influenced by fire and all of them are influenced strongly by frequent disturbances. So, Here's a couple of important things in terms uh, for, for terms that you need to understand. A seral stage is the individual slot that we're talking about here, right? The sear is the entire collection of all the seral stages. So the full sear is basically from uh, the initial colonization all the way to a climax community. That whole thing is called a sear. I'm going to ask you this on a test, so I'm trying to be very direct about that, so you make sure that you understand these terms. The process of moving from left to right on this graph is the process of succession. So that's actually the transition, the predictable transition in plant communities over time. This is a fundamental part of habitat management because we're managing plants and if we understand what which plants are going to be associated with which wildlife species and we also have an understanding of where they fit into succession and what causes them to to uh, persist on the landscape for instance uh, how frequent a fire or what kinds of disturbances promote that particular uh, stage of succession then we can make really informed decisions about how to manage habitat for those species. So here's another depiction of the, the same thing. And uh, you'll see it's very similar over time. Plants succeed from annual plants into that climax community. Uh, they're they're kind of showing some different things. Uh, so I, I just wanted to show you in different ways. Also, uh, you can see some of the, the terms I've been talking about down in the bottom uh, in that text are defined. Okay, so here's the nuts and bolts of what we're talking about with wildlife habitat management. Notice we have a full sear on the bottom and this came from a, a really cool publication showing exactly what we've been talking about this whole time in the lectures. Species have differing requirements for habitat that are associated with different parts of the sear, right? Different seral stages. Notice some of the species may be associated with all of them. They're, they're generalist in terms of where we're at in succession. Some of them are typically more associated with the early stages, like the grasshopper sparrow that we mentioned, the meadowlark. Uh, that's another species that we're concerned about. <clears throat> those are more closely associated with early succession. In some cases, they are obligated to it, like the grasshopper sparrow, they're obligated to early succession, whereas we have other species that you just use it as part of their, their uh, habitat requirements. So uh, it would be a good idea for you to be able to name some wildlife species 
that are associated with different stages of succession on this graph. Okay, so that's a good idea for you to review and just in general to have a general understanding of what kind of plant community assemblage are many of these species associated with. That'll make you a better wildlife manager in general. So this is a pretty cool example showing another important point. So you noticed on the last uh, figure, there are some species that are associated with different several, many different several stages. And this is from uh, Woodcock. They actually use different several stages for different parts of their life history. So you can see they roost in fields. You can see where the, the brooding and nesting cover is, where they're feeding. Those are, those are uh, all used by the woodcock at some point. The only thing uh, for the woodcock that isn't very useful is the climax uh, mature forest. So once the forest have reached closed canopy, uh, you don't typically see that species associated with it anymore. There are quite a few species that are like this. They're using different stages of succession for different purposes in their life history. All right, so here's another cool video that I did when I uh, was faculty at Mississippi State. And look for the phone right here. Do you see it yet? Once we zoom in, maybe you'll you'll start to realize, oh, there it is. Here's another one. Let's see how long, oh, maybe you see it now, right? Notice how poor the vegetation structure is in here for cover, yet that, that fawn, just with a couple of forbs and these associated grasses, is very well hidden, right? How many of you already see the fawn in this one? There's actually two fawns in it. I don't know if you've seen them yet, but one of them, it literally has one herbaceous forb that is creating enough counter shading. And basically what I'm talking about with counter shading is the differences in shadows and lighting. And it has adaptations that are specifically de designed to take advantage of the changing light conditions. So this is an example of a stand that we might be managing to maximize that counter shading. So that structural diversity creates a lot of differences in shadows and species like white-tailed deer might use a stand like this to hide a fawn in, right? This would be excellent fawning cover. Not only that, but because there's so much vegetation at the level of the deer, the lactating female that has extreme nutritional demands uh, has ready access to lots of high quality plants like forbs, which typically for herbivores tend to be very high in quality. So during that peak uh, nutritional requirement, she may be able to not only hide her fawn really well in uh, And in that forest structure, she can also forage really well. So it's great for fawning cover, but it also provides really high quality available nutrition to meet the, the lactation requirements. So you may not have seen uh, this, this uh, video that I'm about to show you here, but the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has some really awesome data on birds that they make available to people. And what you're looking at here is showing you based on the time of year, when animals, uh, in this case birds, like at the center of the range, each, each dot is associated with a species of bird, where they're at. So you can see they're, they're distributed all across North and South and Central America and all in between. And uh, this, a lot of adaptations of wildlife coincide with adaptations that we see in plants. So notice when we get to about April, May, June, they all move through the southeast, right? Now we're in the center of summer, not many birds are here. And then we get around to the fall and then quite a few species come back, even many that didn't go through, uh, didn't go through the southeastern region. Many species even hook through and go 
through our area. So I'll play that again. Notice the dates. Uh, this is, I love watching this. It's so awesome. We get to April, May, right there, a whole bunch of species right here in the southeast. Not many here. Quite a few kind of do this button hook over here and come all through the southeast. Right about September, October, they, they uh, come back through. So quite a few of these species are actually associated with seed dispersal. Based on what you just saw, what would you assume uh, would be the most valuable time for a plant that's going to fruit that needs to be dispersed by birds? When should they do that? We really had two time periods where the, the availability of birds as dispersers might be maximized, right? We have one that's kind of in April, May, and then we have a second migration later in the year, right after summer, and that one has a whole suite of species that weren't even there during the spring, right? So uh, quite a few species come through in September, October. So based on that, we could uh, think about the plants and when they could maximize the opportunity to be dispersed, they should have some plants maybe take advantage of that spring, right, that April, May time frame, and then we should maybe have other species that really target that fall. That's exactly what we, uh, what we see happen. All right, so what you're looking at on these graphs is depicting the plant side of this relationship. So I know there's a lot going on, but there's a couple of important things for you to realize. One, uh, if you look at species like the genus Prunus or Rubus on this left graph, notice that they go from 100% uh, of the fruit of, of remaining to none over a couple of month period, right? If you go, if you move over on the graph and you see the ones that are available more in, in August, September, like the Crataegus or the September, October, the Rotundifolia, notice how steep that decline is, right? So the, all of the fruit is getting removed extremely rapidly from those plants. So uh, if you look at the fall versus the winter, it's the same thing. The winter fruits tend to take several months. Some of those are even longer, right? They may persist for, for three or four months. So what's going on here? Let's think about it. This is a, a really important thing for you to understand. Uh, all of these are, are uh, vertebrate dispersed plants, and most of them are bird dispersed. So why would they persist for different amounts of time? Well, I just showed you those migrations, so you probably have keyed in on that immediately. Most of our plants that are dispersed primarily by avian species will peak fruiting from August through October. All right, so somewhere in that time frame. They also tend to be what we would call determinate. And essentially what that means is all of the fruit on the plant all ripen at once. So think about why they might do that. If you have this really short window of time when all your dispersers are going to be here, it literally might only be a couple of week period, right, with this migration. So you need all of your fruit to be ripe when they're all there. So that's what we see in these species. They have very determinate fruiting, that narrow window when all the fruit are ripening at once and all becoming available all at once. And then we see the animals, which are migrating through, when they get there, they consume the majority of fruit and disperse all those seeds in a really short amount of time. All right, so what about the species that are fruiting through the summer, like blackberry, the rubus? Well, those are often dispersed by uh, birds as well, but they're typically more uh, dispersed by resident birds, all right? So they're not migrating. So we kind of have the opposite end of the spectrum. They are uh, have this indeterminate pattern, so that's a much more protracted fruiting. In fact, on a single blackberry bush, you may see flowers and green fruit in light pink, 
and dark pink and you know that that uh, nice purple ripe berry all on the same plant at the same time and if you think about that strategy you have maybe uh, mockingbirds or you know some of our resident birds like that that are keying on that resource but you don't want to satiate our, your seed dispersers they're going to be around but there aren't as many relative to a migration of a whole bunch of species you know that might be tons of dispersers in comparison but they kind of have taken a longer term strategy where produce a lot of fruit uh, at different times across the summer so you don't satiate your seed dispersers that are going to be around and they're going to come back and eat fruit over time uh, you know they may visit the plant many times over a couple month period so it's kind of a interesting divergence in strategy and uh, it's pretty important to understand when we're thinking about wildlife plant interactions because if you understand what the strategy is from the wildlife and the plants perspective uh, that really can help you infer how to manage uh, for both species simultaneously so here's showing you another graph from a, a different paper that's very similar uh, the main thing I wanted to show you is when birds start showing up, you remember it was March, April, May, you have a couple of species that really key in on, on those migratory birds and they have a really steep removal relative to uh, some of these species that are producing you know, late in the winter or, or I guess early in the winter, late in the fall. That's when they're ripening and you can see some of them may last all the way through till May. Uh, and they're primarily getting dispersed by resident species. Okay, so this is data that I collected as part of my, my uh, PhD work, and I think it shows you a very important point. So the, the bars are associated with fruit availability, and what I wanted you to know is the, or what I wanted you to focus on are the colors. Notice how the bars are different uh, arrangements of the colors. So that's showing you when the fruit are available. All right, so now look on the x-axis. You can see one labeled dormant and one labeled growing. Notice those two bars statistically are identical to one another, but the colors are quite different. Namely, the dormant has mostly July fruit availability, whereas the growing has a substantial proportion of the fruit available in September. All right, so dormant and growing just is uh, telling you when the last fire occurred. All right, so it's pretty typical that we could manipulate the season of fire. We might burn in March for a dormant season fire, whereas it may be in June for a growing season fire. These were in upland pine stands. You can see it doesn't make that much difference of how much fruit is available over the course of a year, but it makes a big difference on when the fruit are available. And if you're migratory birds, you may be you know, dependent on that resource being available in a short period of time. And here I'm showing you we can use the same management practice in the same system and just do it at different times and completely shift what when fruit are available for species and that could be critical if it needs to be a particular time frame so uh, we'll talk a lot more about this kind of stuff throughout the course but this is a pretty good example of how your management decisions could influence the value of a practice to wildlife so while we're thinking about management, I also want to show you some data. This is from Valley Oak, but uh, we could get data from other oak species local here, and you might see something very similar. What I want you to see is that from year to year, there's substantial variation in the amount of acorns being produced, right? So that's a pretty important thing for you to think about. Uh, let's go on and move to the next slide. So uh, not only do you have you know, variability within a species year to year, but you also have variability in the production of a species based on the, uh, the age of the species. They differ quite a bit between oaks. And here 
you can see that they don't even align with one another, right? So white oak is, is peaking in produ production from 22 to 26 inches, whereas scarlet oak is peaking more in the 18 to 22 range, right? So the importance right here, and for the last slide, the reason I'm, I'm uh, bringing this up is we talked about managing for for variability or heterogeneity or mo I think I said mosaic in one of the slides uh, previously. If you're trying to manage for mask production, right, and we have one species, we're going to have these big peaks and valleys where you have complete mast failure some years because you only have one species. So one way that you could buffer that is to have multiple species, particularly from the red oak group and the white oak group. Uh, you could have many oak species, but also having a diversity of age and size classes across those species could help buffer that those bad years in mast, right? We could basically smooth the, the lines out that you saw in the last graph so that we don't have peaks and valleys. We just always have mast available. And mast is a very important resource for many, many species. So, you know, just showing you how we could or why we would want to manage for a diversity in species and also a diversity in age classes even of those species to manage a resource like acorn availability. So here's a, another data set that could be really useful to make a strong point to you. Uh, looking at, you know, when we're talking about the adaptations of plants and wildlife species and interacting, here we're showing, I'm showing you data on mast production from sawtooth oak, which is a non-native oak that's planted really commonly for wildlife management in the southeast and then white oak, which is uh, our native species that, that is often thought of as being really valuable for wildlife. Look at how there's several weeks difference in the peak, right? Most of our wildlife species that need acorns have uh, those needs coincide with the timing of acorns falling from the trees. And then if we come in with a non-native species, that has not evolved with all the species of wildlife that are using it, they actually get produced too early to be useful for most of the species. And in fact, I see it really commonly, people plant that species because the, the, the sawtooth oak, because they have this perception that it outproduces any other oak. And first of all, you can see that the bar isn't even as, as high as the, the uh, white oak so that isn't true, first of all. But second of all, the reason that perception is there, in my experience, uh, from a, a variety of things, which I'll show you on the next slide, uh, one of the things is the acorns are available too early, where they're not very extremely valuable for wildlife. So the acorns fall all at once. You can see how that tends to be more determinate than the white oak, much narrow, narrower time frame but they also don't get consumed so it gives us perception that you have this enormous amount of acorns falling from the tree and it really is that it's falling too early and uh, also the preference is not so good which you'll see on the next slide so we've done a, a bunch of wildlife preference studies and what you're looking at here is a deer choosing between i think there was a uh, 10 species or or maybe even more in this study, uh, but we had a whole bunch of oak species and animals letting them choose between it. So it's really cool footage as part of this. This. So when we look at the preference for species, now let's compare the uh, sawtooth oak to the white oak. So we can literally look at preference for them. Now uh, the blue bar is associated with when the first deer showed up and the red bar is associated with when the acorns were then all gone, right? So we provided these acorns to them, we replicated this in a bunch of sites and we were trying to figure out how quickly do, do deer get there and then uh, how long until the, the acorns are all gone. So uh, one thing I, 
I have right here is a control just to tell you what that is. That is an unbaited camera trap that was placed at each site so that we could see how long does it take for a deer to randomly walk by in front of a camera. So a couple of things should stick out to you. One, white oak took much less time to be for a deer to show up and also for all the acorns to be gone. Another thing that is pretty funny to me is that sawtooth, if you look at the time it took for deer to show up the first time, it's actually longer than uh, the cameras that were unbaited. They were literally avoiding coming to the sawtooth oak, which is uh, really funny uh, to think about. But, uh, you know, this is showing you the data of why the native species would be far superior to the non-native species, but uh, because of some misconceptions about what we're seeing in the field with managers, uh, we might choose incorrectly on, on that particular thing. So th I love these studies, so I just I wanted to show you some of these. Uh, we had some interesting interactions, like I wouldn't have even thought that we would have foxes in there, that they actually were one of the major consumers of acorns. Wouldn't have thought that. This one's really funny. If you notice right there, sort of in the bottom of the track, we had a little bowl <laughs> that came in and he grabbed a couple acorns and then got under the leaf litter and, and uh, went on about his business under there. So would have never thought that they would be getting acorns, but apparently they are. All right, so uh, we've, we've kind of gone through a bunch of wildlife plant interactions and how that relates to succession. So we know that wildlife eat acorns, for instance. So I, I also had this really cool study with uh, some graduate students in the lab where <clears throat> we actually simulated a mast year. So we went out and put out literally uh, tons of acorns out simulating masting trees and then measured how it affected deer behavior. So this top right graph, you can see the pink is how many photos per week of deer we were getting across all these trees that we put acorns out uh, compared to trees that we did not put them was the green line. And uh, the heat maps on the left side are showing you that the trees that were really productive had a really intense use. And what we see is because of that intense use of that area by deer that increased herbivory uh, pressure in those localized areas and you end up with this mosaic in the plant community where these little patches of intense herbivory that promote some some uh, unique plant species that are different than the plants that are occurring in the blue area where the the uh, herbivory is pretty low and that's just demonstrated in species richness over on the bottom right graph uh, with the different colors. Again, the acorns uh, had a lower diversity than no acorns, but when you add them together, that's the blue line there, we actually end up with a more diverse system overall because of the heterogeneity created by animals interacting with the masting of the plants. So pretty cool idea. Wildlife are definitely an important part of the system and driving uh, the, some of the responses that we're seeing through those interactions, which is just really cool to me. So here's a, uh, some drone footage and you can see uh, sort of what I'm talking about. There's a whole bunch of, of uh, oak trees in here and you can literally pick out which ones are masting based on whether or not there are trails going to them. You can see these trails coming going through these little lines and then uh, you can see all of the trees that have a really dark area like the one sort of in the center of the screen right here. Those were all masting trees and literally the intense wildlife use. Look at all the trails right here. There was a cluster of oaks that were all producing and the intense wildlife use was pretty incredible because uh, it was driving a lot of the heterogeneity in the plant community. So uh, all that to say, I just wanted to show you some, some cool examples of how wildlife are responding to 
pulses and resource availability that we might create through different management actions uh, or that are just created naturally through something like masting. And uh, I think it's a stark example of what I've mentioned earlier that you know we need to think about wildlife as being part of the system and not you know a, a an end result of our management, right? It isn't that we manage plant communities and then wildlife respond. It is that we manage plant communities and wildlife respond, and then that affects the response of plants to the disturbance, right? So important things to consider, and it can have important implications when you move practices from site to site because it can influence the outcome of those practices. All right, that's all for this lecture. Thanks for listening, and uh, we'll get you next time.